go to scripture if that's okay with you. Do you guys, you guys yeah. believe in that? Yeah. Um, I want to go to Exodus chapter 17. And I want to read just a brief story. And talk a little bit about, about leadership. And I've got um, three, three questions that I want to throw at you. Three questions for every leader, and, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, I want to read this story about Moses and this battle that ensues. There, Moses and the children of Israel have been hanging out in the wilderness trying to find their way. Exodus 17, verse 8, it says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim, and Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. I love this story, and what I want to talk about for a few minutes is, is um, just this idea of, of discouragement. I really, um, I don't know everything. I don't count myself to be an expert. This is not a TED Talk. Um, I could actually learn from a lot of you in the room. But I will say this. I've been, I've been in ministry and in leadership now for 20 years, which is, which is pretty wild. I brought my 17-year-old daughter is with me. She'll be here tonight. And so I never thought I'd see the day of coming back to the Tri-Cities to speak at a youth conference that my teenage kids would be going to. Somebody, how did this happen? I don't know, mind blown. But, um, but I do know this about leadership is discouragement, I think, is one of the biggest, if not the biggest enemy right. that will come against any leader, sure. any great leader. It doesn't matter what church, it doesn't matter how big or small your church is, it doesn't matter um, what ministry role you play, whether you're paid or not paid, I'm telling you, discouragement will come at you, and, uh, and it's no joke, because that's what the enemy wants to do, is suck the life out of you, suck the vision out of you. The devil's only mandate against you is to steal, kill, and to destroy, and, and, and he, he targets leaders. And that's not to say, not, not to say that we got to have a defensive posture and be like, oh my gosh, the, Satan's after me every day. No, no, no. Uh, it is finished in Jesus' name. We have victory in Jesus' name. And every day I don't have to pray for victory. I pray from victory because it's already been done. But there still is an enemy of our soul that tries to attack leaders. And, um, and I know it. And it can happen in a number of different ways. I remember my first year of youth ministry right here in Richland. I was 22 years old. And I'm like, we're going to do this invite night. And we're just going to like put flyers out on campuses. And we were at Kamayakin. We were at Kennewick. And we were, we all, we even went over to those crazy people at Southridge. You know what I'm saying? We, we just, we passed out flyers. We're going to reach teenagers in this city. And we had free pizza and we had giveaways. We did all the things right for an invite night. You know, had a guest speaker come in. And I remember that night we had, it was the first time we ever had a hundred students showed up in our, in our church building, our little church building over there in Richland. And I thought I was Jesus. I thought this is revival. TBN's going to be knocking on our door like this is going to be talked about in, in churches everywhere like we've arrived you know and so I just remember this moment of feeling like this is awesome we had a big night a bunch of kids got saved and I just felt like I was on top of the world and then the next speed up seven days later next Wednesday night comes no invite night no pizza no guest speaker right no giveaways 35 kids show up and I wanted to light myself on fire and I was like wait what happened to the revival that we just, and we were rebuking Satan and everything, and like, this is the devil, you know? But I remember that feeling of discouragement can happen that quickly. I remember a moment, come on, how many know budget complications can bring discouragement? Are you with me? I did my day of fundraisers. Oh my God, I think the fundraiser is the worst F word that could ever be said. And, and God bless you, we've all put in our time, but I remember not having much budget as a youth pastor, and we were doing car washes out on George Washington Way, flagging down cars in the middle of the summer to try to raise money for camps and all this stuff, bake sale after bake sale, and I wanted to pull my hair out from these fundraisers. I think there's a special place in hell, and there's, there's, there's country music playing and fundraisers happening. I don't know, that's my, that's my theological conviction, cats roaming around. Anyway, it's a whole theology I've built, but, um, but I... I remember budget problems can bring discouragement. Um, sometimes just one conversation with one with the wrong person. Did you ever make this mistake? I remember um, just hanging out with some young guys, some high school guys, and, and they, we had this one guy in our youth ministry named Jeff Latrell, and I loved him to death. But he was like, if there's any kid that's going to be really honest with me, it was this kid. 
And he was there every week or whatever. And so I remember I'm just like hanging out with him. We're going to get Slurpees in the middle of the summer as one would, you know, here in the Tri-Cities and we're hanging out. I'm like, hey, so, so how do you like him youth? You know, how, what do you think? He's like, yeah, it's pretty good. I'm like, I'm like, come on, you can be honest with me. He goes, well, your talks are kind of boring. <laughs> Isn't this funny? And, and, and I don't remember a whole lot of interactions with young people. This is like 20 years ago. But I remember this moment where this 17-year-old where this kid made me feel this big. You know, like, your talks are really boring, but, you know, it's okay. And, and I just remember, it's like, it's crazy the, the power that discouragement can have. Just one conversation with one person, but all of a sudden you buy into it. And the enemy makes, makes you think that next time you're preaching, the whole room thinks wow. your talks are boring. Right. It was only one person. It was only one little person that had a complaint or whatever. But the enemy will use that against leaders. Yeah. to just try to shrink back your courage, steal away your confidence, and make you feel small. And so I want to talk about this with this passage of scripture because Moses is up against this uh, enemy called Amalek, which Amalek in the original language, it means dweller in the valley. In fact, the, the root to that, Amal, uh, means weary or burdensome. So it's the picture, this enemy is a picture of something that wants to bring you down to a valley, something that wants to weigh you down. Wow. It really is the picture of an enemy like discouragement that just tries to suck the life and confidence out of you and bring you down and make you feel small in a little valley. This is who Moses is up against in this enemy called Amalek. And I love what he does here because um, it's very unorthodox. And I love looking at studying the, the miracles of the Bible because God always has a method, doesn't he? He always has a way. He always right. has something he wants to show us. Right, right. But the first thing he does is Moses starts to go up. This, he sends Joshua and the armies out to fight. And he goes the other direction. He starts to go up this hilltop. And my first question that I think we all should ask ourselves today for every leader is what do you see? What do you see? Because Moses is going up this. The battle's happening. This enemy is up against him, conflict, oh my gosh, what's going on? Moses isn't running around freaking out. He's like, you know what, I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to go up to this hilltop. I think what a brilliant leadership move to say, you know what, down here the battle looks crazy. It looks ugly. There's a lot of swords. There's a lot of fighting. There's blood. I need to get a different perspective yeah. of what's going on. I need God to bring me up the side of a yeah. hill so I can see things as a leader that other people don't see. Because that's part of leadership, isn't it? It's yeah. seeing things that other people don't see. It's forecasting things that the other people right. can't see. Part of your role as a leader, no matter what capacity of a leader you're in, is to be able to see things differently. And I really believe that God has given that mantle, that grace on your life to be able to, to see things. And, and, and to, to see things even prophetically. See things with eyes of faith. Right. And when everybody else is like, oh, this isn't, say, no, 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 let, let's remember who's in charge. Let's remember what's going on here. Let's, on. let's have a God perspective. Right. I need that. Uh, something we say around um, in our church a lot in our culture, but that 30,000 foot perspective, it's like, you know, flying in here last night, you know, from, well, I'll tell you the flight from Seattle to the Tri-Cities, we were in a, like a Prius with wings. I don't know how, I don't know how we got here, but it happened, you know, praise the Lord. I believe in miracles, but, but, you know, you're up high and I love anytime I'm, I'm I always, I always choose the window and, and I love just looking out the window, looking at these tiny, I mean, what were massive cities now look so small, even taking off out of Los Angeles last night. And it's just like, whoa, it's just this perspective, this perspective change. And I think that's something we need to ask ourselves for a number of reasons. What, what do you see? What is, it that, um, what is it that you see? Because whatever, whatever you see is what's going to move you. Because where your eyes go, your life goes. Right. Have you ever been driving with somebody that loves to talk? They're driving you in the car and they're, they're, they're chatty, chatty, chatty. But, but have you been with this person that while they're talking to you, they want to make eye contact? And you're in the passenger seat, and you, you're, all of a sudden your prayer life is like going through the room. You're just like praying in the Holy Ghost in the prayer, like, oh God, please. Because they're just like talking to you for multiple seconds. They're not looking at the road because they just want to, they want to make sure you're engaged in conversation. I'll tell you, one of, the word, one of my mentors and one of my heroes of the faith is this guy named Pastor Jude. And he has a church in Ventura, California. And every time I get in the car with him, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, of just the grace of God that this man has not killed himself or other people because he is the worst hence I, I, I tell the truth on this platform. He's the worst driver I've ever ever uh, ridden with because he just, he wants to talk the whole time and he's saying the best stuff, but I can't focus on what he's saying because he's like, Elijah. And, and, and he's like, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, we got, you know, we got a pedestrian. You know, I'm like calling out the road for him. He's like, oh, and he's like swerving and everything. 
and, and we were on the highway once and he's talking, talking, talking. And I noticed every time he's, he's looking this direction, we would slowly start to go. And we, we hit those little bumps on the side of the road six, seven, eight times. You know, and he, was, he wasn't falling asleep. He just kept talking. But he, he didn't learn his lesson. It's like, how many times have we got to hit the, you know, before, before you figure out this isn't going to work. But I realized it's because he's looking this direction. His car would start to drift that direction. And it's the same in life. Wherever your eyes go, your life goes. If whatever's got your attention, whatever's got your gaze, whatever, wherever your focus is at, what do you see? Because what you see is going to dictate where your heart goes, where your life goes, where your prayers go. And I think all of us as leaders should do a self-evaluation, a self-check every once in a while. Like, wait, where, have, I, have I become distracted with other things that aren't as important as my main mission? I'm not even talking about being distracted with sin and the temptation. That's a whole nother message, and, but if the shoe fits, hey. But I'm talking about it, the thing that God's called you to do. Yeah. And if it's been a while since you've heard, like, God, what do you want me to do? Go to the last thing God told you to do and just keep doing that, okay? Just stick with that. That's how my wife and I have done this. People are like, are you going to be in L.A. forever? We're like, we don't know. Because I thought I was going to be in the Tri-Cities forever. But we, we were one of those crazy people that prayed one of those crazy prayers and like, Lord, your will be done. Why do we pray stuff like that? Do we really know what we're praying? Like, God, we just want your will. Do we really know, you know? And then it's like, why am I in Seattle? Oh yeah, because I prayed one of those dumb prayers, crazy prayers a long time ago, that this wasn't gonna be about what I wanted, but it was gonna be about what Jesus wanted for my life. What, what, what do you see? One of my favorite passages in all of the Gospels is Matthew 9:36, and this whole it's 9:35 to 38. But this whole this whole moment, Jesus is teaching and preaching. It's kind of the beginning of his ministry, and and it says he's teaching and preaching and doing miracles in all these villages. In verse 35, and then verse 36 says, "But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd." And then he gets his his crew together, the disciples, like, man, we need to pray. We need to pray the Lord of the harvest, man. And, and they, they have this moment of prayer, and then he sends them out. But I love that moment because he, verse 35 tells us he was, he was preaching, he was teaching, he was doing, it was a picture of ministry. But then it goes from ministry in 35 to this moment where he was moved in 36. And I thought, if I could be honest with you, um, in, the, in the short 20 years that I've been, I've, I've been in ministry, there have been moments where I think my eyes are more on ministry than they are people. Wow. Wow. Which I know sounds like a contradiction, right? A bit because it's like, well, ministry is people. But you know what? I got really good at one, uh, in, in seasons of my life at doing ministry and forgetting what it was really about. Forgetting that even Jesus had these moments where he was moved. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's doing ministry. Yeah, right. But when he saw, there was something about what he saw. Yeah. And it wasn't just him seeing the multitude that the Sermon on the Mount it wasn't just him the feeding of the 5,000 crowds crowds stadiums crowds oh that's awesome amazing no it was Jesus seeing individual people looking at the eyes of individual people see man this person's weary this person feels scattered this person doesn't have purpose this person's struggling and it says he was moved because whatever you see is what's gonna move you right and if if, if, you, if if I don't feel moved anymore then I should I should resign I should not be in ministry or I should say, do everything I can to say, Jesus, I need you to help me get back to that place where I'm moved. Yeah. Because I don't want to be a professional preacher and a sucky Christian. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to be a, you know, something I've said for years and years, we can impress from afar, but you impact up close, right? Oh, it's like, I don't want to be, I, I, I didn't sign up for this thing to be impressive from afar, from some stage, give me a microphone and let me impress the crowds. No, I'm in this for people. I'm in this, God, because when I was 20 years old and I was weary and I was scattered and I didn't know if I had purpose, I'm at Washington State University trying to figure out my life and what I was going to do with my life. I thought I was going to be an engineer. How funny is that? You know, and I'm just like studying math and science and stuff. What was I thinking? And God, and I got to a place just rock bottom, so depressed, suicidal, but God rescued me in that moment and all of a sudden caused me to see for the first time in my life at 20 years of age, it's like my eyes opened in my heart and I had a passion and a drive for something and it wasn't just for stadiums and being this itinerant preacher and, and preaching from, that's awesome if that's what you're called to do, but it was for the lives of individual people. If I can tell the message of Jesus, the story of Jesus and impact one person's life, then sign me up, God. This is what I want to do. 
I don't want to do something temporal. I want to do something that has eternal ramifications to it. I want to do yeah. something that's beyond just the day to day. But we got to come back to that. What do you see? What do you see? And you know what? Oftentimes, you know what? You know what leadership is? You know what influence is? It's putting yourself in other people's worlds. It's putting yourselves in other people's pain at times. I remember as a young youth pastor across town right here in Richland, and I was so, I was just a young preacher, and Wednesday night, and I was just, I was in the zone, and I had my routine, you know? And I'd get my guys around me, my armor bearers is what we used to call them. It's a little outdated term, but some of you know what I'm talking about. I got my armor bearers. What are we, you know, gladiators? What, what century are we living in, you know? Will you be my armor bearer? Sorry, if, I don't know if you guys use that terminology. I'm offending somebody right now. But the weird stuff we say in churches, right? Will you be my armor bearer? Like, pick up my shield, you know? Like, pick up my sword. <laughs> kind of feels awesome, actually, now that I think about it. I'm going to bring that back. Um, but, you know, have a team and you, the prayer and the moments. And it's like, okay, get ready to preach. And, but I remember these nights where, you know, right before the service, worship's about to start. I'm on the front row. And, you know, little Johnny comes over. He's 15 years old. And he's like, hey, Pastor Elijah, you know, I'm just kind of struggling with some things. I was wondering if we could talk. And I'd be like, hold on, jo Johnny, hold on, hold on. The man of God is in his mode. I got to preach in a few moments. Okay, let's, let's talk later, you know. And that little Johnny was Chris Jordan. <laughs> I'm kidding, you know. But here he is. Look what God can do. Um, but, but I remember these moments, and, and I remember later thinking, man, is it really, is that really what I'm supposed to be doing? It's just like so focused on my, my message, and yet like telling these young people, like, like, wait a second, the man of God's got to preach his message. And that's when I realized, man, a lot of times they're not going to remember our messages, right. but they'll remember those moments we look them in the eye, yeah. and we say, hey, how are you doing? Yes, hey, I love you. I believe in you. I want to pray. Can I pray for you? They will remember that more than your three points, ten points, your exit Jesus of Scripture, all that amazing stuff that we do. They remember that moment. What do you see? I think that's a, a powerful thing for us that Moses had to get up and get a different perspective. Um, the second question, what do you see? Second question I think every leader needs to ask is where do you sit? Where do you sit? Moses was up on the hillside. And when he got weary, his buddies who were with him brought over this big stone, this big rock, and he sat down on this rock. And I love this picture because if you're like me, I think in seasons where I feel weary, where I feel stressed, where there's conflict, where things are, a lot of stuff's happening in the, in the church world and ministry life, I find that I tend to strive. I find that I, I, I tend to... Like, okay, go from a jog to a sprint. Like, okay, we got to, man, it's go time. And I got to go, go, go. And it's this, I think it's the natural human condition that we want to, um, we want to strive. We want to make sure it's a win. We got to make sure all this happens. We got to make sure. And I get the details and the inner workings of the church, especially now as a campus pastor. I, I, I have to deal with a multi-million dollar budget, make sure we're spending our money correctly and make sure we're, I'm paying. I have a staff now that I oversee and it's, it's, uh, different than just being a youth pastor at 20 years of age. There's a lot of moving parts to this thing, um, as lead pastors would understand, and even youth pastors to agree with that would understand. But I think the, um, what I love about this story is that when things get difficult, when Moses is feeling weary, when the battle is at its climactic point, who's going to win, who's going to lose, are we going to have victory today? We see him in the posture of sitting. He's sitting on a rock which I think is so beautiful, it's metaphorical, it's prophetic, um, rocks in, 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 the, in the Bible, and I might talk about this a little bit tonight, actually, with the young people, but they, they, they represent foundation. They represent, this is, this is where Jesus said, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church, right? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's this revelation, it's this idea of, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit here because I know who my God is. And instead of trying harder, Positioning yourself to trust more, more deeply. Um, are you right now in a season where things are stressing you out, you're being pulled different ways, and you're trying harder as a leader? Where what you really need to be doing is just, is just trust mm. that God is still in control. That's good. That's good. And um, the simplest illustration I can get, give you is, is flying on an airplane. I, I, I do very easily on airplanes. Turbulence happens, whatever happens, I can fall asleep. I, I sleep on airplanes. It annoys my wife to the nth degree because she's a very nervous flyer, always has been. And, uh, 
And so we get on the plane and she's like, you know, counts down the minutes until I'm out. You know, the planes are like ambient to me. I don't know, it's the sound or the, I don't know what, I'm just, I'm just out, you know, putting my headphones and I'm out. Well, my wife, she's, she's up the entire time and she's like nervous and she's like tapping her armrest and she's like any little bump or whatever and she like white knuckles, you know, the sides of her, her seat and she's tapping my leg and waking me up. She's like, did you feel that? Did you feel that? I'm like, I, I feel you hitting my leg. Yes, what? <laughs> And she's like, no, 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 we just bumped. I'm like, uh, okay, I didn't feel that. It felt like being rocked to sleep like a baby to me. I love it, you know? And she gets so frustrated. And so this happened recently. She was on a flight with me. And I mean, she will start praying in tongues and she will start just freaking out when the turbulence is bad. And I was, um, I was at the window, just, pat, you know, out. And she's in the middle seat. And there's another random gentleman that's in the aisle and we hit turbulence and she looks at me and I'm asleep and she's just trying to find somebody to connect. And so she grabs the other guy's leg. The true story, grabs this guy's leg and he's like, oh my goodness, you know, <laughs> LA women, right? And it's like, and, and she's like, I'm sorry, my husband's asleep, but is, are, we, are we gonna be okay? And he's like, I think we're gonna be okay. You can let go of my leg, you know? It's like this moment, but she freaks out with turbulence. But I know this about turbulence, we all know this. Anytime there's turbulence on the plane, that little buckle seatbelt light goes on and usually the, the you know, flight attendant or the captain himself will get on the microphone and say, he says the same thing every time. You know, we just need everybody to take their seats. Please take your seat. Please just sit down. They say some version of that because the captain knows that the best posture and position for anybody on this plane in a moment of turbulence or slight chaos, no matter the degree, is to actually just sit down. Right. I've never been on a plane where there's been turbulence and everybody's like, oh my gosh, let's stand up. We need to go help them. Let's, let's rush the cockpit. We need to see what is going on. Is he, you know, at it again with the bourbon? What's going on with this pilot? You know, or man, we seem to be leaning this way. Let's get all the passengers to lean this way so we can balance out this plane. Like it doesn't, running around trying to fix problems is actually going to make things worse. But being able to sit, be in a, a posture of being seated, what is that, what is that doing? It's the posture of our soul to say, I'm trusting the captain, I'm trusting the pilot, I'm trusting that I'm gonna let him do his job, we're gonna get through this turbulence, and there's nothing I can do, none of my striving or trying harder is gonna make any of this better. So I just need to be I just need to be in a place of rest and trust that he's in control. And oh my gosh, I wish somebody would have helped me with this in my in my early twenties as a youth pastor because I lived like it was all up to me. I ran ministry like it was all up to me. And let me just say this, never take the place of the Holy Spirit in your ministry, okay? If, if, you, if you right now are the person with all the answers that every person comes to you, every young person comes to you and like, hey, can you help me with this? And like, yeah, that's a great feeling to know some answers and know some stuff about Bible. But I realized in my late 20s that I was making a lot of disciples of Elijah and not disciples of Jesus. Wow. Because young people would come to me when they were 16, 17, 18, ask me questions about premarital sex or ask me questions about what does the Bible say about drinking? What's the Bible say about this? What's the Bible say? And I'm just like, well, let me tell you, let me quote this proverb and let me quote this thing. And I just, it felt really good to give them, you know, the answers. And after a while, I realized it when some of my young people graduated from high school, went to college, and they're calling me from across the state in college because they're like, pastor, I don't know what to do. Well, I need you. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I realized the error in my leadership is that I was the guy, it was, it was all up to me, and I had all the answers. And so there was, I, there was a pivot that took place in my ministry at that moment. And when people came up to me in church and say, hey, hey, what about this, what about this? Instead of saying, well, let me give you the answer, I say, you know what? Have you prayed about that? Have you talked to Jesus about this? Hey, I'm gonna give you this passage first. Corinthians chapter six, go home and read that tonight. Read this, pray, and then I wanna know what Jesus tells you and let's talk tomorrow. Which is not the sexy, awesome, powerful leader way to do things, it's not. It's way cooler to be like, bam, bam, let me quote some scripture at you. You know, I don't know what that was, but you know, let me just, let me fire you the right scripture and give you the answers and cool, you, awesome. But instead saying, no, 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 I, 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 I need to make sure, do, do you have a prayer life? Do, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Or have I all of a sudden become like a, like a Catholic priest, like a go-between? Am I your connection now to God? Are we going to Old Testament here where people can't talk to God directly so they went to Moses? We shouldn't be living that Moses model of ministry anymore because we've got Jesus. We have direct access to Jesus. And so um, I, think it's, 
I think it's good for all of us to, to think about that. Where do I sit? Jesus, is Jesus the rock that we're, that we're seated upon? Is he really the foundation? Is he really in control? And if he really is in control in every area, then, then your life should prove it, your ministry should prove it. Or are you tired? Are you burned out? Are you weary? Because you're running around trying to take care of things. And Jesus is trying to say, whoa, 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 whoa slow down. Let, let me do this for you. Let me help you with this, right? As crazy as it is, I think we've all probably had seasons like that, moments like that, where we're running around and we forget, wait a second. Um, ultimately, this isn't up to me. This is up to God. Right. It's one of the few things that Jesus said he would do. I mean, he did say, I, I will build my church. So I love it. It's something Judah says all the time in our, our church. He goes, he said, grace grows the church. He felt like God told him that in 2008, right before he took over for his dad. Grace grows the church. And grace is a person. That person is Jesus. So it's really Jesus is going to grow his church. He's going to build his church. We get to be a part of that. We get to partner with him. But it's not Elijah grows the church. It's not great leaders like Jeff Morgan grow the church or Matt Weed grows the church. Or we all get to be a part of the church as it grows and do our part and do our share and add our gifts to this thing. But let's remember who is in control. Let's yeah. remember the rock that we're seated upon. Yeah. Right. Right. What do you see? Where do you sit? And last one is who's your support? Who's your support? What I love about this story is when Mo went up the hillside, he didn't go alone. He, uh, he strategically took two guys with him. Aaron and Hur. There's really only four characters we see in the story. We see Moses, we see Joshua, who's got the armies fighting. And then we see this guy Aaron and this guy Hur. Who's your support? Mo wasn't up on the hilltop during a battle, during a weary season by himself. And can I just be really honest? Can we all be really honest in the room? Leadership is, can be one of the loneliest places. Being a pastor can be one of the loneliest places. For a long time, I, when we moved to LA, it was, I went through the loneliest season. I've probably ever been through my whole life. I didn't know anybody. And yet, and now I'm like supposed to be this pastor down here to these people. And all my friends are up here in the Tri-Cities or Seattle. And I, where's my support system? And our, our marriage went through and Amory and I ended up in counseling our first year in LA. Cause I didn't, I was trying to figure out how to be a good husband in, in LA and a good pastor in LA and a good father in LA with all the pressures of this new um, place where we didn't have anybody else to lean on. We we're trying to lean on each other, but we didn't want to lean on each other and we wanted to find other people and there was conflict and we're trying to, you know, we're 15 years into marriage and relearning how to talk to each other, relearning this, you know, this whole season of our life. It was a crazy season of life. And I remember driving around, driving around West Hollywood right one night. Actually, the irony is I was on my way to do a premarital counseling session with a couple and talk to them about marriage. And as I'm in my car, I'm having this argument with God. And I'm, I'm having this moment where I'm like, God, I, I want to go home. I want to go back to Kirkland. I want to go back to being a pastor. That's where it was comfortable. I, I, I want to leave. I want to leave ministry. I want to leave my marriage. I didn't really, but, but that was where I was at. I was like, I, this isn't working. I, I want to leave this all to go back to a comfortable space. I don't like this. I remember in that moment, I had tears streaming down my face. And I'm just driving around the streets of L.A. late one night to go try to help somebody that's about to get married. And I remember this moment where God spoke to me in my heart, my spirit. He said, there's no comfort in change and there's no change in comfort. And it's the, it's the word that I had to hang on to for two years. It was maybe the only thing that I felt God spoke to me in the first two years of L.A., but it's all I needed was I realized, OK, this isn't just about the church community down here, but this is about what God's going to do in me. And there's no comfort change. Change is not comfortable. And so I can go back to comfortability and my comfortable space in the Northwest, or I can embrace the uncomfortability and know that God's going to change me and make me a better leader, a better pastor, a better husband, a better father. And let me tell you, that's, it, it wasn't fun. It wasn't exciting. It was difficult. It was the most challenging season of my life. But I tell you the truth today, after four years, my, my kids, my family, we're closer than we've ever been before because we went through hell together. My wife and I are closer than we've ever been before because we made it through hell together. 
I mean, I'm telling you, as a leader, I'm more confident in just who I am than ever before because I let all the insecurities and the mess come to the surface, try to lead a community full of beautiful models and celebrities and actors. Oh my gosh, you want, you want to hear about intimidation and insecurities? Try to lead a community where every person is so freaking beautiful and you're like, oh my gosh, why am I talking to you, you know? You make way more money than me and you're more beautiful than me, it is ridiculous. And, 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 but God took me through all of this to bring me to this place and this space of, um, of realizing that, that yeah, change is, is difficult, change is uncomfortable. But in those moments of change and, and flex and stretch, who's the support? Who are the people in your life and in your world that are with you? Because we all need an Aaron, we all need multiple Aaron's, we all need hers. Aaron in the original Hebrew language means teacher. Who are your errands right now? I've got, I've sought out errands, and let me just tell, let me just say this, is that it's not the responsibility of the errand to come to you and be like, hey, young leader, I want to mentor you. I'm going to be your errand. No, that's actually, that's actually on us to actually ask the right questions and go to the errands. It's not like, oh God, please speak to Austin Moult. He's got so much wisdom. <laughs> Um, I, I know he's got a word for me and he's supposed to pour into me and so speak to him and a year goes by and he's like, oh, nobody's mentoring me. No, that's on you, bro. That's on you. Austin's right here, right now. You got a question about life? You got a question about marriage? He's been married now for so long. I'm sure he's written a book. Two books, two years. Come on, two years. Let's go. But, but in my life, I have errands in the area of being a godly husband. I've got other husbands that I look up to that are errands in my life. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to ask them questions. Oh my gosh, they've been, they've been married. They've been together for 30 years. That's crazy. I want to I hear about this. Tell me about your struggles. How did you get through the struggles? I, I, I have errands. When it comes to raising kids, I have four children, which is crazy. Especially in L.A. where the people have no children. Listen, on a typical Wednesday, we have, we have 1,300 some people coming out to our service on Wednesday night. We have less than 10 kids in our kids' ministry. That's a, the that's a true reality. We have zero kids' ministry. Half the kids' ministry is my kids. We have, true story, we have more dogs in our service every Wednesday night than we do children. No, 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 I'm not joking. That's a fact. On a typical Wednesday night, you're going to hear a bark at some point. People pack their little pups and their little purses, and there's dogs everywhere. But there's no kids, it's just my, my kids and Judah's kid. Nobody has kids in LA, so people think we're crazy. And, and, but when it comes to raising children, I've got, I've got errands in my life that I look to to help me raise my kid up. Teachers that I need to be looking to. When it comes to ministry, who's the errand in your life? Who's the person that's helping you with your ministry? Who's the, who's the errand that's gonna help you with your finances? Who's the errand that's gonna help you? And, and, and when are you gonna realize that, yeah, you gotta humble yourself and you gotta reach out to some of these people I've got stories for days about crazy people. I mean, I mean, when I was a young youth pastor, I was emailing guys that lived all the way down in Louisiana that had never met me before, bugging them, bugging them, bugging them. Will you come to my camp, come to my camp? And I wanted them to come speak at my youth camp. Actually, it wasn't about them speaking as much as it was. I wanted a relationship with this guy. I wanted 10 minutes to ask him questions. And if that means flying you in to preach, you know, giving you an honorarium, it's worth it to me as a young youth pastor. If we can hang out and have a coffee while you're in town, that's... I just, I just had to go after it. Who are the errands in your life, the people that are gonna be teaching you, the people that are gonna be encouraging you? And, and let me flip this on its head a little bit too. Who are you an errand to? Who are you called to be an errand to? Can't be an errand to everybody. But who are the ones that you're gonna, you're gonna help lift their arms, right? That's the story. Moses is sitting on this rock. His arms grow weary. And as his arms grow weary, they start to lose the battle. But thank God that he wasn't alone. Aaron and her were there to lift up his, it was a team effort. This victory was not like, cool, put one up for Mo. Victory for Mo. No, it was a team effort. It takes a village, ladies and gentlemen. This success in ministry is not going to be about you. If you think it's about you, you're lying to yourself. It's about the people, the support, and the community around you. Who are you going to be willing to? It's like recently, um, I'm part of a running club in LA. We run uh, twice a week. We run from Venice to Santa Monica Pier and back. And I started training and I, I ran my first half marathon of my entire life two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And so, um, yay me. Um, 
but at 41 years of age, I was like, maybe, you know, is this ever going to happen? And, and, um, and so I did it, but I did it because I had all these guys I was running with, these young guys in their 20s, and they're like, you can do it. And they're way faster than me. And these, I mean, these guys are freak athletes, but they love that I come out running with them every week. And so I remember one of the first times I went running was one of the first times I ran uh, up to five miles. I'd never done up to like even five or six miles before, right? I was one of those like, cool, I can run a mile, you know? I'm good, you know? Let's watch some football now, you know? And, um, and this guy named Dante, he's one, of our, he's one of our church, he's one of our college students down in our program in LA. And uh, I mean, this guy is, is a freak. I mean, he, he went to state for wrestling. He, um, he was running sub five minute miles in high school, okay? I mean, this guy is fast. He was actually ended up being a professional cheerleader for the Baltimore Ravens. I know, anyway, random stuff. But he was—he's done all this, all this stuff, and in, in, in a freak athlete. And we start running, and he's next to me. He's like, "Pastor, I'm running with you." I'm like, "I'm like, no, Dante, don't be ridiculous. This is like, this is like a walk for you. Like, please, you know, I'm running like an eight-minute mile pace or whatever. This guy runs half that, right? And so I'm like, Dante, please go ahead with the rest of the guys. Do this. And I'm like, nope, I'm staying with you today. And so we're running, I mean, two miles in, I am like heaving and breathing like an asthmatic chain smoker, like just, like just trying to live, you know what I mean? Mile two. And Dante, he's like running backwards next to me, talking a mile a minute. I mean, this guy shared his whole testimony the whole time we're running. I didn't say two words. I was like, hey man, you know, everyone's so like, awesome. You know, I'm like, I don't know how this guy's doing it. He's just talking, talking, talking. And we go on this run for 40 minutes, you know, five miles. and. And, and the whole time, and at the end, I'm like, Dante, I can't, he goes, he goes, oh, and he goes, you did it, you did amazing, you crushed it, this was awesome, this was great. And at the end of it, my, my, my pace was actually faster than it had ever been before. I'm like, Dante, thank you for that. And I realized there's a principle in there because some of us are Dante's that need to slow up our pace a little bit and go back and help some of these others. Wow that are a little bit slower maybe back here and not just be like, well, I gotta go get mine, man. I gotta, I gotta get after my thing. No, 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 part of our job as pastors and leaders is to find those that are, that are maybe a little bit slower and be there to just encourage. You just run backwards next to them. You're doing great, you got this. Let me just talk at you for a minute. You know, come on, we're gonna, we're gonna get this you know, together. Wow. And, and we all need that. We all need a Dante and we need to be a Dante to somebody else. Last, sorry, I'm going so long. The last one is the her. So you've got the Aaron, which is the teacher. And her, which, oh, God bless her. What, a, what an awful name to have, right? Can you imagine his whole life? Like, what's his name? Her. No, 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 him. Her. <laughs> anyway, just confusing. But her in the original language uh, means liberty. And so not only do we need an Aaron as a support system, a teacher, somebody that's helping us, encouraging us, teaching us, but we need somebody that we can be totally free, totally open, totally honest with our truest self with. Somebody, I can just, liberty, free. I'm just, I just need to be free. I need a her in my life. Not where I'm Pastor Elijah now. It's like, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just Elijah. And let me tell you, that I, I need a her that knows the good, bad, and the ugly of Elijah. I needed, I needed hers in my life that, that knew the mess that was going on in my marriage and how bad it was. I needed some people that were there that were praying for me. And again, that's not stuff I like get up on the platform on a Wednesday night and like, hey, church, so my marriage is going down the tubes. Bless God. You know, it's not like, <laughs> that's not something you talk about with, 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 and share with everybody. But you've got to have a her or two in your life that can carry your arms, that knows your struggle, that knows your difficulty. That doesn't, it's not, not just that Facebook friend. It's not like, whoa, look at my, look at my LinkedIn profile. Man, it's blowing up, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like what's LinkedIn? Look at my MySpace page, man. This is awesome. But I'm talking about a true, true friend, true support system of the person that, that knows the real you, That's good. knows knows the struggles. I have got um my 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 closest friend in my life. We text each other every single Monday, and it, we do a Tell the Truth Monday, and it's literally like. It's literally in the area of, of sexual purity, if I can be really honest. It's because it's like, I'm 41, I've been married 19 years, but I'm still on this journey like every other person in this room. There's never this place where you've arrived and no temptation will even phase me. They're all sisters in the Lord, I see nothing else. No, I'm freaking LA, okay? I go to church on Wednesday night, it's boobs everywhere. Can I say that? I just did. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, 
won't say that tonight, okay? Um, but but it, it, it's real, and temp, temptation's there. And the enemy's doing whatever he can to take out leaders. And so I literally, every Monday, I know I'm going to be texting with, with my buddy who's been a, a really close friend for a long time. And, okay, tell the truth Monday. Did you, and, and it's not tell the truth like, did you have an affair this week? I mean, if we did, hopefully we did. But it, it's just tell the truth. Right. Did you go on Netflix looking for a show that might have something in it? There you go. Be, be brutally honest with yeah. yourself and with me. Did you really want to watch that show because you thought it'd be funny? Or did you watch that show because you thought, you know, maybe there might be something that my eyes want to, might want to see wow. because I'm stressed right now as a leader and I need an escape. Right. It's that level of realness. Wow. It's ugly. Where did your thoughts go this week? Where did your eyes go this week? Right. What's going on? Tell the truth Monday. And I, I'm 41 years old and I'm doing I thought this was like stuff that like young college guys did, you know, like, yeah, purity groups, accountability, bro. You know, like 41 and I'm doing this. And, and a lot of it's just out of prevention. It's like the stakes get higher. The, the more you go in leadership, the stakes get higher. The more your responsibility increases, the stakes get higher. And I realize this isn't just about young Elijah with 35 kids and a youth group across town. I've got a wife now. I've got four kids now. And their lives could be over in a, in a few moments of stupidness on my part. I've got a ministry that I oversee. And this whole, my job could be done in a few moments of so I'm going to tell the truth Monday with a her. If you don't have a her, somebody you're talking about, and again, you know, maybe it's not in the area of sexual purity, but whatever, whatever your vice, whatever your struggle is, we all got them, right? right. But yeah. you, you got to have that her, somebody that you're talking to. Um, and I end with this, and um, I hope it's okay I'm being vulnerable, real in this kind of a setting. Right. But I, so e even as recent as just a few years ago, um, being in a place where I was struggling with depression. I hadn't struggled with depression um, really since like high school. And my mom remembers these stories, but I would have kind of cyclical depression. And I remember she brought over intercessors to the house. In fact, she would like surprise me with them. You know, I would get home from school and there's like a whole team of these ladies at the house. I'm like, oh, mom's having a Bible study. And they're like putting oil over my bedroom. And so I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, just sit down. We're going to pray for you. I'm like, oh, thanks, thanks mom. <laughs> You're casting devils out of me and stuff, you know. And, um, mom was gangster that way. I love it. But, um, but I found myself, it had been years and years since I struggled with any type of real serious dark depression. And then all, all of a sudden, almost, it seemed like out of nowhere. I started to go back into this habit, this, this, this way of thinking, this dark cloud over my life um, that hadn't been there for, you know, a decade or so. And it was embarrassing. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor at the city church and I'm leading worship every week. I'm preaching sometimes. People know me and I've got this, this leadership thing I got to carry. And so I, I can't, I got to, I got to figure this out. And I remember not even telling my wife about it, but she knew something was, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Oh yeah. All right. All right. But I couldn't shake it, and I was having just dark thoughts that I couldn't shake. And I, I think part of it, that there is a spiritual dynamic to depression, and sometimes it's a chemical thing. And some, there's a lot of different angles. I'm not an expert on depression. I'm not a psychologist. But, but, um, but finally one night I'm hanging out with, it's just my wife and me and, um, and Judah and Chelsea, who are our, our bosses, but also our closest friends. And uh, we do life together, vacations together, and just everything. And, we're sitting at the table, we're just playing cards one night at their place. And um, it, it was Judah's wife, Chelsea. Some of you know who, who Judah and Chelsea are. She said, Elijah, are, are you okay? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And she's like, have you been just struggling? She says this, she goes, have you been struggling with depression, just depressed thoughts? And I stare at her and I'm like, uh. <laughs> And all of a sudden, tears start welling up in my eyes. I'm like, dang it, the Holy Spirit told her something. I hate it when the Holy Spirit does that. And tears start streaming down my face, and my wife starts crying instantly, because I don't, I don't cry very often at all. I, I, I wish I could be more like Matt, Pastor Matt, that way. I love it. The couple times I've heard you preach, there's always there's gonna be laughter, there's gonna be tears, and I think it's one of your greatest qualities. You connect with people so well. Um, and uh, 
Bob crying at the table, and she continues to just ask, you know, how how bad is it gotten? Have you thought about have you even thought about killing yourself? And I didn't want to admit it, but I I had this real moment of just it, it was embarrassing. It wasn't pretty. I'm just a mess of just snot and tears at the table. We're trying to play cards, you know, and I'm gonna you know slobbering on drooling snot all over the cards. It's not it's not a it's not a nice moment, but. I remember that moment that came around my, my wife and my friends, my hers came around me and said, okay, we're, we're in this with you and let, let's get counseling. We're going to pray. We're going to do whatever it takes. And all of a sudden they're like, they just went in that mode. We're going to lift that, that, that arm's getting weird. We're going to lift this arm for you. We're going to help you. We're in this together. You can't, you're not supposed to do this by yourself. And, um, and I hope we all have that. And if you don't have that, let that be one of your 2019 goals to cultivate that. God, show me, I, I need some errands, I need some herds that really know me, right. that help me. Right. Um, because we're all weak and we're all flawed and we all have our weaknesses. I just got very real about a couple of mine. Uh, but I hope that helps you to be vulnerable and real about whatever it is you might be facing. Discouragement's real and the enemy's trying to take out leaders. But, um, but I know God is more real and more powerful than any enemy that's coming against you. And I just, can I just close in, in prayer? And we can transition to whatever else we got going on. I know, I, I think I went longer than 30 minutes. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but I just love to pray for you. Jesus. <clears throat>